Hello, I'm Dr. Mitchell Usam, Dean of the College of Business Administration at Sam Houston State University. Hi, I'm Dr. Kurt Jesslein, Associate Dean of the College of Business Administration. Hello, I'm Dr. Shani Robinson, Associate Dean of the College of Business Administration. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the College of Business Administration's virtual panel discussion entitled, What Do We Do Now? As educators, it is important to us to foster an environment that encourages discussions on a wide range of topics, regardless of the difficulties. As a nation, we are facing the reality of a pandemic that is impacting our physical, emotional, and financial well-being. In addition, as a society, we are grappling with immensely sensitive issues to include race relations. One of our goals for today's panel discussion is to provide a forum from whence we may listen and learn. I want to thank our panelists, alumnus Brian Hall, Professor Emeritus Vic Sauer, Associate Professor Cassie Henderson, Assistant Director Jordan Chang, and Student Body President Amanda Lee, as well as our moderator, Dr. Anika Simmons. I also want to thank you, our audience, and those of you who submitted comments and questions that will be directed to our panelists. I have a lengthy tenure with SHSU in a variety of roles to include student, faculty member, and now an administrator. With that being said, I recognize that our COBA students will enter the business world where they will encounter challenging issues, and some of those will be controversial and difficult to discuss. One of the goals for this particular program is to demonstrate that we can have meaningful, productive, healthy dialogue, even when the conversations may be somewhat uncomfortable. We hope that today's program allows us to listen to our students, faculty, and staff. At the same time, we hope that we can all learn from and appreciate others' perspectives. If we are able to do so, then we will have achieved some degree of preliminary success. I want to personally thank everyone who has contributed to this event, as well as everyone who will be participating in the program. The more we communicate with one another, the better we can understand the multiple perspectives we collectively have. By sharing this common experience, we can learn from one another and better understand the value of diverse viewpoints and concerns. At San Houston State University's College of Business Administration, we pride ourselves on developing business professionals. Thank you in advance for your participation in this program. We hope that as you view this discussion, you will keep an open mind, listen to others' perspectives, and hopefully we can all learn from each other as we all work together to support positive change in our college, our institution, our nation, and the professional business world. Hello, Bearcat family. I'm a professor of management in the College of Business Administration. Thank you to the dean, the associate deans, and the assistant dean. I want to acknowledge the dean's office for being so supportive and contributing so much to this program. We also want to thank those of you who have shared such compassionate and thoughtful sentiments about how glad you are that we're putting something like this together. It is my understanding that this is the first time that COBA has launched a program in which its primary intent is to have an open discussion about race relations. Putting this event together has taken an incredible amount of work and coordination. I can say it has been a pleasure to work with such kind, responsive, and hardworking people. I am proud of this courageous effort to discuss such sensitive issues as many individuals were pleased when President Hoyt sent out a letter about standing in solidarity on June 1st. This event aligns with the effort to walk in that solidarity. For many, COVID-19 began to impact our lives through shelter in place orders during the beginning of March. The virus brought about its own amount of pain and discomfort. Many of us were dealing with the staying at home off, um, orders without professional sports, with, with dancing that we love, without our favorite restaurants. It was during this time frame that many individuals heard about Mr. George Floyd. He was a Texan. But on May 25th in Minneapolis, the 46-year-old was pinned face down on the ground in handcuffs with the knee pressed against his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. When the video of his death was released, intense emotions erupted and stirred up painful memories for many. 
Many were pained with how he called out for his mother in his last moments. All over the world, we saw outcries in the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Brazil, Mexico, and even New Zealand. In fact, there was a peaceful protest of over 60,000 people in Houston for Mr. George Floyd. We send our deepest sympathies and condolences to his family. Several grapple with the heartbreak of witnessing this tragic event and other events such as the deaths of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. A shared consensus emerged that something should be done. This event is one of several steps we hope to take along the path to answering the question, what do I do now? On June 12, 2020, Pew Research Center stated that in the past month, 69% of Americans were talking to family and friends about race and race equality across racial and ethnic groups. We want to continue in this vein. This event is about understanding one another and building a coalition among our community. We can disagree without being discourteous. However, we realize that the communication surrounding this event has conjured up all types of feelings and emotions. Many people are really tired of processing and dealing with this type of content. I myself at times have felt both emotional and mental exhaustion. As business professionals, we understand that we work in a global economy and we have to tackle issues in the workplace. To get to know one another, we have to break down surface level barriers. We believe that positive changes can occur when people join together in solidarity. We are grateful that the panelists for this virtual discussion are brave enough to discuss these sensitive issues publicly. Understandably, some had concerns about the composition of the panel but each individual panelist was selected for a variety of important considerations. Our goal is to present perspectives of varied interest. We know that this conversation will likely walk a tight line as we attempt, attempt to tackle difficult issues, but we will be cautious not to villainize or categorize people based on comments or questions. This session is not about coming up with quick fixes and we're not here to check a box. Tackling issues related to race will take hard work, dedication, and an investment towards positive change. Most of the panelists have listened to several university programs discussing these topics nationwide. So far, we have not seen any panels allow for the submission of anonymous questions and comments. We are, pr we are proud that we included this element. But similar to those honorable panels and discussions, we're here to listen, to learn, and ultimately to act. Though I am the moderator, I will share my opinions when relevant throughout this discussion. Clearly, I do not represent all African-American people, but I'm confident that a variety of interests will be represented throughout the discussion. Please note, some want to be referred to as African-Americans and other as Black. For the purpose of this conversation, we will utilize the terms Blacks and Whites. Thank you for joining in and listening with compassion and openness. We want to have empathy and promote peace with one another. On that note, Let's move to our first question. Vic, a few comments came in where people stated that this incident occurred in Minneapolis and had nothing to do with Huntsville. Why are we discussing this here at SHSU with COBRA? That's a very good question, Dr. Simmons. But you know, every day in our classrooms on campus at Sam Houston, we discuss topics as diverse as physics and chemistry and art, architecture, engineering, accounting, uh, and few of the students in these discussions chose to work in Huntsville after graduation. So the expectation of faculty is, is that our students who are participants in those discussions will take what they learned in those to wherever they end up throughout the world, from Germany to Thailand, anywhere throughout the United States. And and we further hope that they take what they've learned in those discussions and take actions to add value and change the world. Uh, the fact that we're having this discussion here in Huntsville on the campus of Sam Houston State University doesn't imply that what we're discussing applies ex exclusively here. We're just the venue. The impact of the discussion will manifest wherever those who hear it live. And that can be Huntsville, Minneapolis, or wherever. And also in this regard, there is no perfect community. Some communities have developed practices and procedures that work better than others. And by having our participants in this discussion spread out throughout the United States and the world, we're exposed to some of those best practices. And the better that we can identify those and understand how we might adapt those to our own community, the better we're gonna be at creating change without everyone having to reinvent the wheel for themselves. So I think this is an appropriate venue for that discussion 
Minneapolis would be an appropriate venue that, for that discussion. The important thing is that we're having this discussion and we're having the opportunity to um, change the world. Absolutely. Would anyone like to add to that? Well said. Okay, excellent. All right, our second question. A lot of comments came in discussing how these <clears throat> events actually sent them on like a personal journey of self-reflection and deeper research into America's history on race relations. Have these tragic events taken any of you on a journey? If so, please explain. Cassie? Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Uh, yes, this has definitely taken me on a personal journey of learning and then obviously self-reflection. Uh, in the last you know, month or so, I've read many articles, um, listened to diversity and inclusion professionals or experts, um, heard many personal stories uh, from people experiencing racism. Um, and in a nutshell, what I've learned is that I've been somewhat ignorant about racism in America and what is needed from me by Blacks and other minorities. More specifically, a couple takeaways, like main takeaways is, you know, I've learned more about systematic racism, racial bias. These are two terms that, you know, we hear in the news, and for me, it wasn't something that I really focused on. So learning more about it, the meaning um, behind it has really caused me to reflect and, and have a better understanding of what Blacks are feeling, what they're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I want to focus on racial bias, because, um, you know, racial bias is like the subtle way of showing our prejudice towards others without being overtly racist. And, you know, there's a million examples of this, um, but just to share a couple, you know, this would be like, um, imagine a woman walking down the street as a black man uh, walks by her, maybe she uh, clutches her purse closer, but she wouldn't do this necessarily with a white male. So this is kind of, um, you know, not being overtly racist, but you're showing that you're prejudiced against this person. Um, another one is assuming that a black male working for a college or a university is a coach, rather than assuming that he's a professor or a member of leadership mm -hmm. team. So this racial bias is, to me, the most destructive um, because it's so common, it's so, um, it occurs so easily and without conscious thought. And so recognizing this, talking about this, um, realizing that this happens every day, this is something that I feel like we all need to take you know, a deeper look in ourselves, be willing to talk about this, be willing to acknowledge it, um, and, and be aware of the impact that these behaviors, these thoughts, statements have on others so that you know, change can occur. So that's kind of what I've learned. Um, also, uh, how did this impact me? Well, you know, I had to take a look at myself and say, why didn't I know this before? I mean, I felt a little embarrassed, really. Um, why didn't I know this? I need to learn more. I need to continue on this path. Um, I also learned most importantly is that it is not enough just to say, I'm not a racist. I treat everybody kindly. I treat people fairly. I have a diverse group of friends uh, and expect some kind of change to happen. I mean, this is what's going on, but clearly there's no change happening. So in addition to that, those opinions kind of indicate like a lack of concern. This is something I didn't realize. Um, so there needs to be more sharing, more listening, understanding, and learning among us for real change to happen. Um, personally, hearing the personal experiences from others um, with, you know, on their experience with racism had the greatest impact on me. And so for this reason, I encourage and I hope that more conversations like the one we're having today and others will continue because I really think that that is the greatest step towards a change. Thank you. And Jordan, you said you, said you have something you'd like to add? Yes, um, as Dr. Henderson was speaking just now, um, I started to think of uh, certain things um, and started writing my own notes to that. Um, it's also been a position of self-reflection for me um, you know, growing up where we read, you know, in our history classes and in our history books of the civil rights era. And when I say a self-reflection for me, it's more so a realization of we're living through that sort of history right now. Um, so it's a moment of um, empowering some of my white friends and white students, you know, which 
part of history, which side of history do you stand with? Do you want to stand with? Um, because right now we're, we're writing the textbook. Um, so it definitely is, as Dr. Henderson was speaking, it kind of triggered that memory in my head. And I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. And I, and, and I can just say for me and, and my husband, you know, we've gotten so many text messages and phone calls and invitations to, to podcast, to talk about race and issues that we never have. So we've known people for 10, 15 years and just lived, you know, near them. And they invited us over and said, you know, you know, we're sorry. We never really researched and really looked into this. Can you, are you open to having a conversation with us? And, and there's been lots of tears and there's, there's, there's been lots of social distance hugging and um, people are, are really reaching out. So I think you're right, Jordan. I mean, I do think that this is a turning point. Brian? Uh, yeah, wonderful. And, and and Dr. Henderson, thanks for 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 opening up um, um, that part of the conversation. And uh, I'll I'll be brief, but but I think it's important for for our listeners to to really know the the subtleties that can address the subtleties that were mentioned uh, by Dr. Henderson. And you know, Facebook is one of those mediums that people are using to do a lot of things, and and we probably will discuss some of that uh, throughout this conversation. But what, what I found in my personal journey was a moment in time just a few weeks ago where I literally sat still for a moment and realized I'm not okay. That I, as a corporate diversity and inclusion person um, that, that lives and wakes up and, 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 and operates in the space of diversity, inclusion, and, and, and e equality is that um, as a, just a human being, I wasn't okay. And I had to really, I really had to verbalize that. And the only way I could was I had went on Facebook and I just put hashtag I'm not okay. Cause I couldn't say anything else. I didn't want to say anything else because I didn't want to blame anyone or, or bring anything negative into it, but just say that I was not okay. And kind of like what you just stated, friends from that I've been friends with for a long time reached out and said, let's talk. And I think for those that are listening, it can be just that simple, that just open the door for your friends, whether they're black or white, it doesn't matter. Just open the door to the conversation. And I think that's the journey that, uh, that it's invoked in me, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, our next question. Um, one wrote that it seems Mr. George Floyd was a turning point with regard to race in this country. They think it took too long for white people and other minorities to realize the prevalence of racism. What are your thoughts on this, Amanda? Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's absolutely right. Um, coming from a personal standpoint, um, just kind of like Dr. Henderson was saying, I was ignorant and I want to admit that. And I've admitted that to people that I hold dear to my heart to show that it's time for change. I think it's been time for change. This has been happening and people have been ignoring it, including myself. Like I am not excluded from this at all. Um, it is time, it's been time. Um, I think it's really cool to see that we can, we can do something about this. This is not, oh, this is just movement. No, this is something that we can work on and this is something that we have to have a heart change in. This isn't like, okay, like I'm, I'm on board now. No, it's a heart change and it's a passion change. Um, I think for me, um, it's been hard seeing that I've been ignorant in that. I hold the title of student body president and that's representing all students. And I haven't been, I haven't been representing, representing the culture at Sam Houston and admitting that, admitting that to myself, a lot of self-reflection in that, that was hard to admit. It's hard to remember that, man, that was where I found my pride was that I was representing every student and I haven't been, um, but I'm thankful for those around me, um, really my executive board um, who um, have just taken me in and I've admitted those things to them. And I know that's still, that's still not exactly what we're going for, but it's a start and I wanted to start that process. Um, so I think it's been good to see that there are people um, to help you through this time, to help you understand um, what, to specifically me, to help me understand what white privilege was. Um, coming from a small town, that wasn't something that was expressed a lot. and It wasn't something uh, that was made known um, to me specifically. Um, 
so yes, absolutely, it's time. Um, really great to open up this conversation and see that we need to represent, as far as myself needing to represent the whole student body and, and not just myself in that. Absolutely. Thank you for being so honest. And you know, that's, that's really what it takes. It takes for us to share our experiences. And I, and I know for me with some of the, my friends that I've spoken to, they just didn't even realize, this is what they said to me, what we go through. Because I was explaining to one of them that I had to have a, a minor procedure. And as an African-American woman, um, the statistics show that sometimes we don't get the best treatment as compared to, or the same treatment as compared to other groups. And when I had to go in for that surgery, I brought my three-year-old and my two-year-old and my one-year-old to the room in the size of a bath. It's really a small room, but I, I had to, I feel the need to humanize myself. Now, am I saying that this person was a racist? Well, no, I, but you don't know. And so I always feel that I have to humanize myself and, and prove that my life has value. So these three kids will miss me if something goes wrong. And that's one of the things that I think that people don't understand that that's something black people have to deal with. We, it's always in the back of our mind and we have to go out and show that um, we, are, we are human and please see us as such. Um, anybody else wanna add anything to that? Mm. Yes, Cassie. Um, you know, just going off of what you just said, I think that, that hearing stories like that and realizing that, you know, these feelings are a daily occurrence for black people. I think that's what I didn't realize mm -hmm. and, and was shocked to find out and heard and, and disgusted by it. And so I think that a lot of people are realizing that and, and realizing that that has to change. That that's not acceptable. Yes, yes. I mean, um, one of the research, and we'll move on to the next question, it just talks about how I think black people talk about race more than white people do. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think black people talk about race a lot because we feel like it's something that we have to do to, to successfully navigate in the world. So as a black woman, can I do this? Can I go here this late at night? Da, 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 those types of things. Not saying that other women don't have those same concerns as well, but my blackness is another um, factor in that. Um, anybody else want to add to that? Okay, our next question. Some stated that they were hopeful that Mr. George Floyd's death was indeed a turning point. They stated that they hope that we can walk kindly, respectfully, and honestly about our different experiences in hopes to live in the America that we all dream of together, the American dream. Brian, what role do you think corporate America or business leaders will play in the effort to move toward a more perfect union as stated in the preamble of our constitution? Well, that's quite a, quite a question. And there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's actually, um, and let me again recognize the audience that, you know, this is not easy. This is not something that I, this is not something that, that a death that, that most of America, if not most of the world got a chance to see. You actually had a chance to actually witness it. And you can't unsee that. And for many, that was their starting point or their jump off point of, whoa, you know, the shock value. Um, and I'm not disrespecting that if that was your stepping off point, but you know, you don't have to look very far to, to see many more examples like that, that were not caught on film, that were not shown in a, in a, um, a, a phone video. Um, and, and like you just said, Dr. Simmons, um, as a black male, um, it is, um, it's 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 visible. I mean, it's it's just recognizable, and and unfortunately, and maybe fortunately, because this is what some of the conversations are about, is that it guides our behavior. Don't go jogging in your neighborhood without your ID. You know, little things that you that most take for granted. Those are things that we have to think about. So, what does that have to do with the corporate America or the business uh, community? Um, Twenty nine years at Shell, I can tell you. I can, I've had the, 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 I guess the awesomeness to look back over the last few weeks and remember moments where my race played a huge part in how I felt and per, and visibly how others saw me. Um, and there's too many to get into, and it's not a reflection on Shell, it's a reflection on the, on the corporate environment. So let me get quickly to a couple points I'd, I'd really love to make. One is we must be candid in this conversation. 
I think subtlety is no longer um, the way that's going to shift uh, a culture that corporations, when I think about it, and companies, the question that I would ask, would you make a decision based off, based off of economics or equity? And most companies, if you think about it, make many, if not all of their decisions based off of economics. And so when you think about being driven by that, which again, nothing's wrong with that unless you avoid e the equality side of it. And so I think corporations should be from the top down, down to up, uh, really be thinking about the subtle things that are happening inside their businesses, whether you're a large corporation or a business owner, are you, who's the face of your company? Who do you put in front of your customers? Um, who do you, what stories do you tell about the capabilities and the successes of folks that don't look like a white male or a white female? How do you go into your community and invest in communities that are your customers or could be your customers? Um, so I think the couple things that I would say I would recommend highly, because again, this is a cultural thing, a structural thing, and in some cases, a policy thing inside companies. So one, I think you have to humanize this. Each one of your employees are humans. They they come to work because they want to do something for a family, for their well-being. They want to grow. They want to take advantage of that American dream. Second of three is you've got to uncover the differences, celebrate them. We have employee resource groups inside companies that were started because people wanted to get together and see each other and go, what do we do now that we're in here? Those organizations now have to be celebrated as business delivery groups. They bring results to that economics. And finally, um, I think you have to build value, more value as companies and businesses around how your success truly depends on equality. If you don't show the economics being impacted by equality, then I don't think you're going to change very rapidly or successfully in the business community. So build equity to leverage diversity and inclusion would be my final thought. Wow, and that's awesome. And and Brian has has worked with diversity and inclusion for the past ten years, and as he said, with Shell Oil for twenty nine years. So that that that's really um, powerful information. Um, I do want to add again that I used to be a consultant in my previous mm -hmm. life, and I worked for Accenture, and I went to um, the University of Texas at Austin. And when I was recruited by them, um, Accenture basically was hiring from UT at Austin, A and M. Rice, you know, those schools, and they realized that they didn't have um, the diversity that they were looking for in terms of their new hires. So one of the partners suggested, well, what we do is, why don't we also recruit from Prairie View A&M University? Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't, you know, demand that anyone's going to get a job or it, from UT, Rice, A&M, or from Prairie View, but what it does is it gives you a more diverse pool so that you can see talent from all different types of groups. And I, when I was younger, I didn't really in, in understand the impact of that as much as I do now, but that was a powerful move because some people um, inadvertently think, well, when you're being more diverse, perhaps you're lowering the bar. Well, that's not what diversity is about. There's brilliant people with all types of um, uh, gifts and, and intelligence that they can contribute to the bottom line that Brian just spoke to. And I know now 20 years later that some of the people that they hired for Prairie View are now partners there. So my, my point is that there's all kinds of ways that businesses can work to diversify and, and to help uplift everyone by giving all people an opportunity. Um, Vic, did you want to say something to that? I agree with you, uh, especially about uh, expanding the recruiting efforts to uh, Prairie View A&M. And correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was an active faculty member, we had a very diverse student population, uh, more so than most of the universities within uh, the United States. And I was very pleased to hear many recruiters who came to our career fair uh, say that one of the reasons they recruited at Sam Houston mm -hmm. is that they could recruit from a very diverse uh, group of students, uh, new graduates, if you will, uh, and uh, they appreciated the the uh, fact that they could do that at Sam. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on to Jordan, and Jordan is the assistant director of, for the Center for Diversity and Intercultural Affairs. He's worked at Sam Houston for five years, and he graduated with a master's degree in higher education from Florida Atlantic University. So the question I have to you is, I want to acknowledge that someone wrote um, in our survey that this really hit home for them because their mother knew Mr. George Floyd personally, and his memorial was held at their church home. Based on your experience and your role as assistant director for the Center for Diversity and Cultural Affairs at SHSU, how do you think students can move forward and make contributions towards solutions in a positive manner? Jordan? Thank you for that question, Dr. Simmons. Um, so firstly, my sincere condolences go out to that student, their family, and their church family. Um, I think this is a very important question, and I believe we've been seeing some of that happen across the country. Uh, young people, and specifically Generation Z, they're utilizing their voices to implement change and for a lack of better words, an awakening to some of the racial injustices that have been occurring across the country. Um, you know, we see this through social media. We see young students uh, outside protesting. Um, so with that framework in mind, I encourage Sam Houston students to utilize their voices. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a multitude of resources at the institution uh, for students to work with to, to further some of the good work uh, with regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the Center for Diversity and Intercultural Affairs. There's the Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, we have Amanda on the panel. There's student government. Um, there are multiple multitude of cultural student organizations. Um, additionally, each college has, not necessarily each college, but a lot, of the, a lot of the colleges have their own diversity and inclusion committees where students can be a part of to, you know, work in diversity programming or um, utilize some of the resources they have. I also uh, take a step further and I'd encourage students to utilize their time in college to learn more about those that are different from them. I think that's very important. Uh, when you think about it, oftentimes students are entering college and this is their very first time um, being a part of a diverse group of people. Um, Dr. Vic, you just mentioned um, Sam being diverse. That is still the case. Sam is one of the most diverse uh, institutions in the state of Texas. Um, so for example, if you're a member if you're in Greek life and you're a member of a Panhellenic sorority, reach out to an mm -hmm. MPHC organization and collaborate, host a program. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage students to participate in bystander intervention. If you're a witness to a racial microaggression or something discriminatory, use your voice and say something. If you're unsure of what a racial microaggression is, then reach out to the Center for Diversity and Intercultural Affairs or institutional diversity and inclusion and request a training. That is something we've done in the past before uh, for student organizations, for the freshman class, um, for the student org leadership retreat, we've done trainings. Um, so I, I encourage students all together to participate in diversity education. Um, another, another thing, something that I've been proud of in the past um, is our annual diversity leadership conference. Mm -hmm. um, this past February marked our 16th annual conference and we had over 500 registered attendees uh, from eight, about eight or nine institutions, including Sam Houston. There is a lot of great dialogue and discussion that happens at this conference. Um, we've had keynote speakers from Tarana Burke, founder of the Me Too movement, uh, to Michael Sam, the first publicly gay player to be drafted in the NFL. And um, it was mentioned maybe two questions ago, I can't recall who on the panel mentioned it. Um, but unfortunately, what we've seen in the past is a lot of the students that attend this conference aren't necessarily the students that need diversity education, if you get what I'm saying. They, you know, these are students that um, are already well-versed when it relates to microaggressions and racial justice and uh, diversity. Um, so I implore students to uh, utilize their voices on campus and look at these resources that we have set up at the university. And if there's something that you want to see get done or if you have suggestions, contact us. Reach out to diversity at shsu.edu with your suggestion. 
That's excellent. That just reminds me how as a professor, you know, oh, I'm having tutoring and the students that come are the ones that don't need tutoring, but the ones that you hope come don't show up. So I know exactly what you mean. That's not always the case, but a lot of times it is. Amanda, did you, did you want to add anything to that? Okay. No, no, that's great. I was explaining Greek life for sure. I'm in Greek life and I think it's really cool to see what other councils are doing. Like mm -hmm. Panhellenic is not going to look the same as IFC and all the other councils. It's really cool to see we're all in Greek life, but we can all come together and be diverse in that. So Greek life for sure is a, is a great way to find out, you know, more diversity about your organization and then others as well. All right, great. So we're gonna go into the next question. So we need to know that, you know, Vic also served in the army during Vietnam era, after which he spent 20 years in industry and 20 years in higher education. And of course he has his lovely wife that he's been married to. How many years again? Is it 53? 53. 53 <laughs> years. That is amazing. That, that, I mean, that, that's, that's just an I, awesome. I still life. call her my first wife. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we got a mouthful question here and we tried to, you know, we got a lot of survey comments and so we couldn't answer all of them. So some of them we kind of collapsed together. So here's, mm. here's your next question, Vic. This person wrote, or these people wrote, that the videos that they have seen will stay with them forever, especially the video of Philando Castell's daughter fearing for her life and wishing the neighborhood was safer. Mr. Floyd's death and all the deaths before and after have impacted them and motivated them to create change, protest, and speak out against systematic racism and any type of racism. They suggested that it may not be enough to just speak out, but one must proactively move towards positive change. Vic, what are your thoughts on systematic racism and how we can proactively move away from racism? Well, I couldn't agree more that proactive change on the part of individuals, proactive action on the part of individuals is what it's gonna take. We can't sit back and say that some movement is gonna save us here or, or change things. It's gonna take proactive actions by individuals. But for me, it's impossible to watch those videos without having a very visceral and emotional reaction. And I don't think that depends on race at all. You know, I can vicariously see myself in the position of George Floyd and ima just imagine what he went through and the horror of that situation. Uh, it's impossible to watch those on the one hand, but necessary to watch those on the other so that we can learn from that. And that brings up the point that even horrific events like this can spawn good outcomes. And what are the good outcomes that we can look to take from these types of events? Well, heightened awareness of the continued existence of racism is one. And then that's not sufficient. What you have to have is an increased resolve to address it. And that's where the good comes from these events. So the question here is, does systematic racism exist? Well, it's, there've been a lot of correlational studies that have been done over the years that examine this question. Many of them are methodologically flawed. Uh, and some say, yes, there is systematic racism. Others say, no, there is no evidence of systematic racism. But I would like to cite a recent uh, study that I read just this past week that was headed by a group from Texas A&M Commerce. And they examined racism and sexism in public education administration. And they used a very rigorous methodology. And their study found that black assistant principals were 18% less likely to be promoted than white candidates who were equally qualified, even after education, experience, school level and school location were controlled for. And when black candidates were promoted, it took them an average of six tenths of a year longer to be promoted from assistant principal to principal. They also examined the situation for women assistant principals. And women were 7% less likely to be promoted from assistant principal to principal than men with the same controls in place. And when women were promoted, their wait time averaged 0.68 years longer than their male candidates. So a rigorous study like this seems to indicate that there is some factor at play besides the merits of the individual who is in a particular position. They're being held back from promotion are required to put in more time before they're promoted, before they uh, actually obtain that promotion. So the playing field is not level in, in, uh, in uh, K through 12 education uh, administration. 
there are some pockets of society that we can look at where there are more pure meritocracies. And you hear uh, one of those being touted as uh, professional sports. But I've been alive long enough to see the evolution from a highly racist uh, uh, professional sports venue to one that is highly inclusive and where you're judged more on your, the merits and your athletic ability than you are on the color of your skin. But it was a very difficult uh, journey to get to the point where that is true. And that journey was led by individuals at, more so than by organizations. Uh, the Jackie Robinsons and Willie Mazes of the world had a profound impact on baseball that NAACP and other organizations did not have. So it's going to take people working very proactively in order to make these changes occur. We've pretty much addressed the legalized racism issue through the repeal of Jim Crow laws and through the enactment of equal rights legislation, but that's the easy part in this battle. Uh, it's important to note that our panel discussion is not directed towards politicians because politicians don't hold the keys to solving this problem, at least in my view. The, to eradicate racism and sexism and other forms of discrimination requires changes in the hearts and minds of individuals. And I think open conversations such as we're having today is one very key part of the solution uh, of how do we get rid of racism and sexism in our society. That, 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 that's excellent. But I, I will say, and I, I want to um, ask you to clarify on something because I, I'm thinking that some in the audience hear what you say, and I really appreciate those studies. And when you mention professional sports, they may say, yes, Willie Mays and in baseball and in football, we've seen diversity in the player level, but what about in the owner's box? How many teams, how many NFL teams are owned by a person of color or how many NBA teams or commissioners are people of color. So um, is it that that diversity is palatable on a player level, but not in the leadership? How would you respond to that? At this point in time, I think you're absolutely correct. But you see movement in that in the right direction there. Right. Uh, but it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Whereas you could say perhaps at the player level, it's an accomplishment. It's something that we can say, okay, we've done a pretty good job there. But we so what can we learn from that? What occurred during the 70 years that it took to get from uh, a racist uh, professional baseball um, establishment to one where there is inclusion at, at a very high level uh, at the player level uh, today? What happened during those 70 years and what can we take from that and apply to other aspects of our society as, as learning uh, tools, things that we can do that might accelerate the process? And what can baseball do to accelerate the process at the ownership and coaching level? You know, they, they have much to learn from that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point, Brian. I, I got you. I got you next. It's, it's just, I, I, I'm happy that you're saying that because you actually saw that. So that's why the vantage point of uh, different generations, we perceive it differently. So perhaps the younger generation might say, you know, surely it wouldn't take another 70 years. And I know that's not what you're saying, but I think that generationally people will really perceive that response differently. Brian, what would you say? Yeah, and wonderful. And 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 Vic, thanks for the for the for the message there. And I think it's important, you know, we're we are all part of the Bearcat family um here, and that's why we're doing this. And so it's not in in a a mo moment where we have to agree or disagree. It's really just, we're opening up conversation. And one of the things I was shaking my head about was, um, was the fact that when you think about systematic, um, today, things can happen far quicker than they've ever happened. As a matter of fact, some of us complain at how quickly things change, how quickly companies change strategies to, on, in their business model, how quickly we adapted to this, this moment that we're living in from working from home. So the, the, I think we, we owe it to our audience to go, we can't look back at the past too much because your rearview mirror is only that big. Your windshield is much larger. And I think we have to, and, and I don't want to preach here, but I want to say that the, we need all hands on deck to say, if we know that something is blatantly wrong, then let's use all of this education, this brain power, this money, 
um, this access that we have through technology, and let's require ourselves to change it far quicker. Um, and I think if you use example like sports, uh, I go, there are plenty of people that will go and pay a lot of money to watch a black male play on a football team, a basketball team, or something like that. And how many of those folks would welcome that same person or someone like them into their home? I think we have to really recognize that while the athlete is probably lauded as a superstar in many ways, in many shapes, that they aren't represented in the boardroom or in the management ranks. Um, and but they have the best skills. So, uh, you know, or they can have some of the best skills, I should say, because that could be the other side. So I think I want to make sure that even as we talk about the statistics and the wonderful examples that we have of the past, that we really say, now what are we going to do about it? Because that's what I think this whole conversation is. And so at what point should 50% of the ownership in major sports around the world have diversity and inclusion and, of course, equity? in it because that's what people are missing a lot right now while they're sitting at home they want their sports um so what a great place to start um but anyway i hope that made some kind of sense but yeah, i think yeah. it is important to look at mm -hmm. it did i think jordan did you have something jordan no okay okay vic no i i couldn't agree more okay um okay. and i don't hold up um uh professional sports as the perfect meritocracy by any means Mm -hmm. but it's one that many people refer to and they, they hold that up as an example. And where there is something that appears to be at least on the right track or has gotten to a level that um, is more uh, aligned with what we really believe it ought to be, is there something there that we can learn? And even though it took 70 years you know, for baseball to get to where it is now, uh, with in today's world, can we compress that to seven minutes? At, <laughs> perhaps, you know, can we really make the changes much more rapidly? Right, right. And from a business perspective, I just have to say, because I do study some of this, there's an article that basically talks about, and this is linking what Vic and Brian said, it talks about um, are um, Emily and Greg more horrible than um, Jamal and Keisha, and how ethnic sounding names receive fewer callbacks, even when the credentials and the requirements and everything are exactly the same. So that's the type of systematic racism that people would um, put forth. Um, it's, it's something that, like we said, you know, it, it's, a, it's a heart change, it, it's a choice to try to um, look at things a different way. And one of the solutions that I know some organizations have put in place is to anonymize, to where you take out the name and you, you take off any gender, and then you say, okay, these are the requirements, um, this is the criteria. Of course, this is after you have a diverse pool. You have to have a diverse pool for this to work. Take all that information off and just look at the requirements. Now, I know some organizations are considering that, but I really appreciate that conversation because Vic, I actually didn't even know, I didn't know that. And I consider myself uh, a person who loves to read and I, I didn't know that people lauded the um, professional sports world that way. So thank you, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to do some more research on that perspective. Um, so the next question goes to Cassie. Cassie has been an associate professor of accounting at Sam Houston State University since 2012. She grew up in El Paso, Texas, a border town with a population consisting of 80% Latino and 12% white non-Hispanic. So Cassie, you have a, the question that is uh, everywhere. People are talking about it on the news, newspapers, magazines. There are lots of questions in the survey. This is one of the ones that came in the most. And it said it was about Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Cassie, how do we even process these terms? And what are your thoughts about this in this discussion? Um, yes, thank you. Um, well, I think that I have an understanding of both meanings. So let me explain. This is my opinion, of course. Um, the, for the response to Black Lives Matter, saying all lives matter. One, people that say that either don't understand the Black Lives Matter movement, they don't understand the message or the intention behind it, or they do and they just don't agree or support it. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. Mm -hmm. um, 
Also on the All Lives Matter statement, I feel like maybe people are saying that because they want to seem like, hey, yeah, we're with you. All lives matter. We're all the same. However, that is taken as dismissive, maybe offensive to Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter movement, and from what I understand, is that Blacks are saying, listen, we're not valued. Our lives are not as valuable as white lives. And we're trying to get you to recognize this. We want you to recognize this, see this. So when you respond with, yeah, all lives matter, it's kind of like you're saying, whatever, it's not important. We're all important. We're all the same. We're all equal. When they're trying to say we're not equal, that's the point. And so I think that all lives matter, people that say that may have good intentions, but maybe they don't understand what they're saying or how this statement can be taken as offensive or dismissive. So there's a lot of, um, there's some metaphors on social media that, you know, have attempted to try to explain why saying responding with all lives matter to black lives matter is not you know necessarily the right approach and so one of them that stuck with me and i wanted to share um because it was pretty simple is this uh and this was i just took this from the internet um sitting down to dinner with your family everyone gets a serving of the meal you don't get any so you say hey i should get my fair share and as a response your family member says everyone should get their fair share well, that's a wonderful, a wonderful sentiment. Indeed, everybody should get their fair share. And that was your point in the first place. Um, however, the comment is dismissed you and didn't really solve the problem that you don't have any food. So I think this hopefully will kind of explain why, you know, saying all lives matter is not necessarily the response that black people want to hear. They want you to understand their feelings, their struggles, so that change can come about. Absolutely. Thank you. Jordan, do you have something to add to that? Um, I 100% agree. Um, and I think the metaphor was great as, as well. Um, all lives matter seem to come about, you know, in response to Black Lives Matter. Um, and then from my perspective, in an attempt to kind of silence the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and change. Um, so I just, I'm agreeing with, uh, Cassie. Okay. Anybody else? Brian? Yeah, it's the, um, thank you, by the way, Cassie. I'm, I was expecting to learn something and I'm, and that was, that was really, um, thank you for that. But what I wanted, what I would offer as a, as an addition is that, um, is the why, the why behind it, because I think, um, no one wants to feel slighted. I think that's, if you, if we, if, if I can walk away today and go, if that's the message that everyone receives is that no one really wants to feel like they're getting the short end of anything, right? Um, and so I have had the pleasure of having a few conversations, as I stated earlier, with a few friends. And, um, and some of them are offended by the fact that, or have said they were offended by the fact that we are saying that our lives matter when all lives matter. And, and I had to listen because that's really what we're asking folks to do is to really listen to each other. And so when you start to hear them, you, you hear that all of us are humans and we're all afraid of something. And when we see something that we're afraid of, we, we have a reaction to it. And, and I think what's good about seeing the all lives matter is that we get to discuss that too. So I think it is important to recognize, and, and this is what, where I've landed, is that I'm not going to say to my friends and the world that Black Lives Matter as a way for you to feel that, that you have to give up something in order for me to matter. I think the message is simply that we have seen history and experienced history where actions have treated us as if we don't matter. And we're saying, let's stop that. And when you stop that, then together we will we will be able to prove that all lives matter. Does that mean? And I think that's so I think it's important to not for us as the black population to not be totally offended because someone says all lives matter. I think it's yes yet another open door for us to say, well, let's talk about both of those and really come to a, at least an understanding. And uh, so that's what I've seen with it. Vic? Yeah, Brian, I, I think that that's a tremendous response. I have one other metaphor I might offer. I have five grandchildren. 
And when one of my grandchildren is in trouble and is having a problem, self-esteem issues or whatever, I sit down with that grandchild and I talk with that grandchild and I tell him, you matter, you matter to me, I love you. He knows that I'm not saying I don't love my other grandchildren, but he's the one in trouble. He's the one who needs to hear the message. And I think it's the same way here. I think people who perceive Black Lives Matter as threatening the value of white lives and other lives is looking at it from an entirely wrong perspective. Mm -hmm. The issue here is not that any particular type of life matters more than any other particular type of life. All life indeed does matter. But where are we having the difficulty today? Where is the population that is having the greatest issue with whether or not their lives va are valued by people in authority? And the black mm -hmm. community certainly is an area that is suffering as a result of that. So to say that Black Lives Matter is not saying we don't value everybody else's life as well. It's we're dealing with the community that's having the greatest difficulty right now. And we're trying to bring some resolution to those problems. Well said. Excellent. And Amanda, everyone else has had their say. Would you like to say something? Yeah, um, I think I've really, um, and just being on this panel is learning a lot too. So I really enjoy the metaphor of being at the table and nobody's giving up anything. Just like y'all are saying, like, we don't have to give up anything, but we need to recognize this is where we're at. And like everyone is saying, like, this is something that needs to become equal. It's not something that's so far behind that we can't achieve. And I think something super powerful that I've watched on social media and it's resurfaced and, and coming on again, but there was like the simulation um, of students and this person was reading out, if you have never had to deal with this, step forward, step forward, step forward, step forward. Mm -hmm. So what the simulation saw is that there were a lot of white people who were so much farther forward than the black person in the group. And the person is recognizing that you're starting way out here while they're trying to play catch up from where you're at. Um, so I think that's super powerful to see that that's still happening in, in my daily life. Like I've had the opportunity to do things probably because of this, the color of my skin and because of the opportunity as I've had, it looks better on a resume and going on from there. Like they may not have had that opportunity because of that. So um, super powerful things. And, and thank y'all for the metaphors. I think that's really informative. Absolutely. So I, so I think what we're saying is that um, the Black Lives Matter movement is not about denigrating the worth of any other ethnic group. It's just about highlighting a specific problem that we're dealing with and that we have been dealing with and we want to continue to pursue it in a positive way. Brian, and I will say um, also that Brian serves on the board of directors with the National Diversity Councils for Women, Minorities, LGBT, Veterans, and Those with Disabilities. And this is a mouthful, so this is a big one, Brian. And it was a lot of questions about this, a lot of questions. So this one is compressed again. So many people feel that peaceful protests are a right of the American people and that this even warrants such behavior, especially since we have seen it here as well as in so many other countries. However, some believe that the presence of the looters have hijacked the peaceful protest and diverted the attention away from the message of the effort towards equality. As a business professional, how do you decipher between protesters and looters since the looting impacts business? Further, in your opinion, what actions should businesses take to help provide positive solutions for the inequality that many people feel? Brian. <laughs> wow. Yes maybe and twice on tuesday <laughs> no no what a what a question because this is polarizing and so i'm going to mix in a little bit of my personal because i yes as a business professional we all are in many ways business professionals um in much of our our work um but it's again back to the human part people are angry i mean if, if we can agree that there are people that are angry and many show it in different ways um, many of us, many of us suppress it because I'm a happy person. So I try to take anger and go put it somewhere and say, if I don't feed it, it'll be okay. It'll go away. Um, but let me be clear. Looting is breaking the law. When you are doing something to destruct someone else's property for whatever reason, that is against the law. And I think it should be dealt with. And, um, but what I found in the journey, uh, that I've been on is that, Looting has happened when people were happy. 
sports championships have been won around the world and what ha what 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 has happened people are running through the street many of them just celebrating uh, in Denver, when Denver won its Super Bowl, its first Super Bowl, I happened to be in the city. We drove right to downtown and to celebrate. And the next thing you know, people were being tear gassed because people were doing the wrong thing. So I think in this case, we're, we're, let's don't get the squirrel syndrome um, and see the shiny thing and go, oh, looting, that's, that's bad and we need, to, we need to focus on that. It's so I, I say it should be handled and it shouldn't happen in the first place. So if you're someone out there who's done it before or thinking about doing it, don't. Peaceful, peaceful protests have worked and we have plenty of, of, of historic examples, but we also have examples where peaceful protest has incited more people across social media channels, Colin Kaepernick happens to be and still is one of the most glaring examples of someone who said, let me use my platform to bring attention to a problem. And he has not worked since. I think that, and that's a whole nother panel discussion, by the way. But I, so I think that those of us and those of you that are out there that are thinking about, boy, look at every time these protests happen, we wanna board up our doors because there's gonna be the looters. That's a small percentage of the population and they should be dealt with. Looting is also interesting as I've shared because it's, it can happen because people are angry and some people are more angry and that's how they choose to do it. What I think we have to do is all agree that our right to protest <laughs> something that we disagree with is not a, U, a US or an American right, it is a human right. And I think what, what I've seen when you look at, some people use Houston as an example, a great example of how peaceful protests <laughs> happen. Well, that just didn't happen because someone said, go be peaceful. It happened because when you looked across those lines, you saw someone of every color, every creed, every, every degree and all united. And I think if we can take a message from that, that is if we can act like this is our problem, not yours or not mine, I think we'll start to see more peaceful um, um, uh, conversations and or actions. Now quickly to the business side. Um, you know, if you're a business inside a community, I believe we may find ourselves taking for granted the power of you being visible in this conversation. If you're a storefront owner, are you visible in the conversation? Do you even host a community gathering in your business to say, look, I'm here because I am living the American dream, but some of you don't and can't and aren't, and I wanna be a part of the solution. So part of protecting business is being a part of the conversation and actually being a leader in it and being visible in doing that, showing that you care, showing that you see, and showing that you hear. And let me end again with this business community of acting intentionally. I don't think it's more complicated than this. Hire from within your community. Show that you're actually giving jobs, not giving, as, as, as Dr. Simmons mentioned earlier, uh, that you're actually uh, give, providing jobs for people that are qualified and they should be from your community. Tell good stories about your employees that don't look like you. If you happen to be a, a, a white male, then are you the one in your commercials or should you have someone that looks differently being the face of your business? Do you support programming in your community that helps to build the equality space? Are you a supporter of the NAACP, of the Urban League, of the Unidos US and all these organizations that are doing things to help build equity and, uh, and capability and capacity in the community? And are you visibly investing in your community? So I think that businesses, Dr. Simmons, have to be the leaders in the conversation on equity and equality, because the people that are working for you are in these communities, and they are part of the population that is peacefully protesting outside. Are you allowing them to peacefully protest inside to get your systematic systematic uh, issues and challenges fixed. I think that's, that's kind of the bigger picture uh, that I see. I, I thought that was very good. Very good. We're going to, we're, we're going to move on to Jordan 
And the last point about Jordan, um, during his graduate program, he completed his graduate assistantship within the Office of Diversity, and he found his passion for diversity education there. So Jordan, my question to you, the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and even Ahmaud Aubrey has brought to the surface that many Black people feel unsafe. And this came out a few times in our mm -hmm. survey. Um, perhaps potentially targeted, even when they're jogging or driving or bird watching, or even in their own homes, someone referred to what happened, um, I believe in Dallas. Um, Jordan, do you think that the apparent increase of attacks will desensitize people and beget more violence or produce more positive dialogue on a personal level? Good question, Dr. Simmons, thank you. Um, you know, I'm a hopeful optimistic. So I personally believe that these acts of racial bias and violence are producing tough and uncomfortable yet productive conversations. Um, in my opinion, it is important to understand that in moving forward, you're going to have to address uh, tough situations. You know, I have a lot of Black family and friends who've been personally, and even myself, who personally desensitized um, to some of these situations that have been going on for years. Um, however, interestingly enough, uh, have found motivation when allies step up and advocate for justice as well. Um, you know, the, there's a saying, uh, if you're neutral, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And I think that is similar to the situation right here. Um, as I mentioned before earlier, we've seen this play out in the civil rights era. I wasn't born then, but I read it in the history books in class. Um, and it was clear and evident that the civil rights era in the 1960s pushed forth a change because people of all backgrounds were able to come together to produce positive dialogue and that, and, and that change. So I'm going back to the beginning. I'm, I'm a hopeful optimistic that um, this occurs during this time. Okay, absolutely. I'll just say, um, just to give some anecdotal support about the safety issue, you know, we live in a relatively nice neighborhood, but we just innately, we don't even talk about it. I don't feel comfortable with my husband um, walking out by himself. We feel better if um, I am with him and even safer if my children are with us and then we feel totally comfortable if we have our little poodle with us and what we'll, what we're really what we're really saying is that um we, we're not saying we live we think we live in a neighborhood where everyone is a racist that's that's not what we're saying at all we're just saying that um as a black person a lot of times there may be an assumption of of guilt or that maybe he's doing something wrong if he's out by himself and to not even deal with that we just always go together. And that's, and again, I would never even say that out loud before this because it's just how we live. And then I realized through talking to friends that they were like, you do that? And I was like, yeah. And so that's what part of these conversations is about just sharing our experience and being un unsafe is a real part of um, a lot of um, black people's experiences, unfortunately. Does anybody else wanna add anything to that? Okay, so Amanda. A lot of people, and I want to say that she's the newly appointed student regent for the Texas State University system. So, I mean, Amanda is making it happen, okay? So, Amanda, a lot of people felt helpless and unsure of what to do after seeing what has been happening with race relations in the United States. I know that you were on the SHSU Ally Student Panel and with the Center for Diversity and Intercultural Affairs. What are your suggestions on how non-minorities can be an effective ally? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I think being an effective ally comes with a heart change. Um, for me, it's faith-based. So looking back at the gospels and seeing that we're all created in God's image and in God's image, we are perfect with him. We're not perfect people, but he made us in that image. Um, so that's something super powerful just to even see that we're created by him, a perfect creator. So that's faith-based for me, but that was a really specific heart change and um, that may look different for a lot of different people but um, for me that was one of those things and um, not I think one of the next thing is not just checking off the boxes it's not just saying oh I did my research today we're good no it is more than that it's more than just step by step it is constant reminder it is a daily task it is and not a task as in 
oh, I have to do this. It should be something you want to do. And it should be something, um, being on Sam Houston's campus, like everyone is reflecting is that we are diverse. These are your classmates. These are the ones who are going to sit beside you at graduation. These are the ones who are going to help you get to the positions you want to be in. Um, so learning more about that is super, super crucial. Um, I think for me, um, that's been something that maybe some can relate to is listening and not trying to change immediately. There's power in listening to someone and not trying to immediately have a solution. This has been going on for a long time. There's been people who have tried to have immediate solution. And it's, again, we are a fast generation, but in that we shouldn't want to immediately criticize or question or try and give a solution that we may not know enough enough information on. Um, and I think in all that, um, admitting that you have a privilege and, and learning what that's about, um, what white privilege is, um, it's, I think back in my hometown, it was always like, if you have white privilege, everything in your life is great. Like, that's not what white privilege means. It means that you don't have to worry because of the color of your skin. You don't have to worry about certain things. And um, that was something for me that I had to figure out in college. Um, seeing this diverse group of people come together and love each other. Um, I didn't know that I had white privilege and what that truly meant. Um, and then I think lastly, that's super important is um, someone holding you accountable. Um, even though this is a heart change, it you slowly learn everything. And as hard as that is, you were learning to correct what your mentality was before. So someone that you, um, can trust on and rely on to hold you accountable and things were like, hey, Amanda, maybe like, let's think of it this way, or, or maybe here's another way you can think of this, or here's another resource that you can look at. Um, I think we as um, a student population and even faculty and staff can provide those resources for students. Um, it's super, super powerful, I think, from a student standpoint to see that there are faculty and staff that want to support you, that they want to see you peacefully protesting, that they want you to use your voice, um, which is something that is a hard line, I think, for students to realize is that faculty and student or faculty and staff are here to support you. Um, so in all that, being an ally, not checking off those boxes, the heart change, um, and then also having someone hold you accountable. Excellent. All right, we're going to move on. Brian, you have our next question. Thank you, Amanda. That was excellent. Um, research suggests that there are cues in the environment that even children receive about who is good and bad. What are your thoughts about this and what can be done about the subtle messaging that goes out within society that categorizes and potentially defines people based on skin color? Would you agree that racism is learned? Brian, what is your thoughts? What are your thoughts? You're muted. You're, you're muted. I said I wasn't going to do that on this call. Um, the um, This is an emotional one. Maybe it was good because I was kind of choking up a little bit there on this one because we're talking about uh, uh, children and, and we're talking about young adults. Uh, and of course, we're talking about many of us in my position where I'm, I've been around for a few years. Um, yes, racism. I mean, I don't know how we can say um, that it's not learned. Um, Amanda just mentioned... Uh, God, our, our, our faith and, and faith in God. And if you read any scripture, it, it is not, nowhere do you find in there that hate should be part of what we do, right? Or our, 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 our think, it's love thy neighbor, um, every step of the way. Um, so yes, I think it's learned. The problem I think that's bigger than that is that it's perpetuated. Because you can unlearn something. I mean, and I hope that's a word. I, I, I do have several degrees. The, um, <laughs> but you can unlearn something. And so I think we don't necessarily need to pounce on the fact of, is it learned? Because it has been for generations. The question is, what do, how do we fill that gap? How do we get rid of that and fill it with something? And I will say that it took us a minute to get to the, to the word or to the space of, of spiritual and, uh, and, uh, and religion. But I tell you, um, we have got to become more of a faith-based community and society because I believe no matter who you pray to, I think we need to look at that because that should guide all of our behaviors. But let me quickly get to the question of how do you do, how do you deal with it? Um, 
one, you do have to have the conversation. You started this, this conversation off, uh, Dr. Simmons, with the fact that 69% of the families, I think you said, are, are having race relation conversations. Um, I hear too often, my kids don't see color. I don't see color. And I go, but there's a definition for that. It's called color blindness. Uh, and if you're not colorblind, then you do see color. The question is, do you judge based on what you see? And there was a time when seeing someone different made you curious to now it makes you cautious. And I think we have to recognize that quickly. And some of us have mentioned that we have come to that realization in a sense uh, over the, the last weeks or, or months. And I think we need to meet that head on. So when it comes to whether or not there is an experience of racism or that you believe that your child or you have learned it, let's immediately shift gears and go, what's gonna help fix it? One is we must keep friendships and, and connections that are outside of our race. Everyone should make an effort to sit next to someone on the plane or on the bus if we get a chance to do that again, that doesn't look like you. Just start with just that action. You don't have to say anything, just sit. And just recognize that humans are humans you can be. The second thing is that open family discussions around the dinner table should be really, um, I won't say aggressive, but they really should be meaningful when it comes to this. You should ask your children, what did, they, what did they experience today in school? And ask them to describe their friends. And my goddaughters here in Dallas are two beautiful children that come, then when they talk about one of their best friends at school, they go, oh, and he has dark skin like you. But they don't say he's black, he's African-American or anything. They say he looks like you. And I think that that's an innocence. But if they said, oh, he must be an athlete or he must be fast or he must be, or he doesn't learn the way that I'd learn. Those are the things that I think start to creep in. And so Dr. Simmons and team, I think let's don't be mad that it's happening or that it exists. Let's actually put in behaviors that really address it. And I think if we do that and use a spiritual context around it, I think we'll slowly start to chip away at it. And I'll, I'll end with this because Amanda brought it up. We've been cautioned as professionals in the diversity and inclusion space that we can't just go to our companies or our circles and say, fix racism, because there are people that will stand still in their tracks because it's a big deal. But if we say, just start having the conversations with someone that doesn't look like you, or maybe comes from a different space or a different country, and just start a conversation around what makes you tick? What do you like? What don't you like? And just have that open conversation. That's what we should do. Um, to address it, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you for mm. that. Um, Vic, and I think he mentioned his lovely bride, but he's also the father <laughs> of two children and the grandfather of five. And we have a question for you, and this is one that's basically been alluded to through our entire discussion so far, and it is, and this, this was very prevalent in the survey. Sometimes it's hard for people to understand what people of color experience because they are not necessarily subjected to similar mm. occurrences. The concept of white privilege is based on the premise that white people have not had to overcome the obstacles that many black people have had to face. Do you think white privilege exists? Do you think it would help us move forward to have a discussion about white privilege? Vic, how do you respond to this question? Amanda and Brian have done a great job of responding to this question, actually. So I'm going to change a bit from what I had planned to say. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, I grew up. I've had black friends all of my life. And I grew up in the 50s and 60s, you know, before integration became uh, the law of the land, even. And in retrospect, I think back to hanging out with some of my friends. I worked construction during the summer. So mm. I, I worked, I was introduced to a lot of people. We lived in a multiracial neighborhood. So I was introduced to a lot of people of different races and we became friends without thinking anything of it. Nor did we think anything of the fact that I could attend their basketball games at, at their high school, but they could not attend my basketball games at my high school. Mm. It was almost at that time we thought, okay, that's the way the world is. We mm. accept the way the world is to some, some extent or another, and we just have to live within those constraints, which is not the kind of thinking that moves us from a racist environment 
to one that is more inclusive. It's, it doesn't get us to where we want to be. And I'm glad that both Amanda and Brian brought in the role of religion. You know, if uh, religion guides my life, uh, and the parable that Jesus chose to talk about what it means to love your neighbor, he chose an example that was not friendly to the Israelites. In fact, you could, you could think if he recast that parable today and was speaking to a white audience, the Good Samaritan would be the good black person. And if he was speaking to a black person, a, a black audience, the Good Samaritan would be a white person, someone who was distinctly different. The message is that we are all brothers, we're all neighbors, and we're called to love everyone the same as we love ourselves. So it's a very high standard to which we're called. I'm a white person, and I've not personally experienced racism. I was, a I was a sports official in rural Alabama in the 1970s, and I would sometimes be the only white person in the gym when I would call basketball games at rural high schools. But I never felt the sting of racism. I was treated very well and developed great friendships with the administration and coaches there. Um, maybe I was naive. Maybe that was white privilege at work. That, uh, But I like to think that I was a pretty good guy. They were good guys. And we, we saw common ground there and we became friends because we had that common ground and racism did not enter into the equation on either side. But having said all that, I was born white, that wasn't my choice. Some of you were born black, that wasn't your choice either. I think that God had a reason to create each of us the way that he did. So, we don't have the power to change that. What we do have is the power to change is whether we're racist or not. Mm -hmm. If we're racist and sexist, that's a choice. As Brian pointed out, we're not born that way. We learn that behavior. And if we can learn it, we can unlearn it. And I think if we come at this from the standpoint of white privilege and accept that as a premise, that it, it doesn't necessarily provide the best way to lead to a solution to that. I think what, it's like being born white has conferred some original sin on mm. all of us who are white, and we're all guilty now until proven innocent. Mm. Uh, and I, I realize that's the backside of the coin that the black communities have to deal with in so many ways uh, over so many years. So I think we need to think about the way we discuss these issues, racism, sexism, discrimination of all kinds, love of our neighbor, all need to be important conversations that we have every day and with as many people as possible. But we need to conduct those conversations in a way that brings us together. Yeah, I had mentioned uh, the, the baseball example. Jackie Robinson took a tremendous risk to be the trailblazer. Blazer. The white owner also took a tremendous risk to be the person who hired the first black baseball player. Both suffered as a result of that. Jackie Robinson certainly suffered much more. Uh, if you read his life story, he suffered greatly uh, as a result of his activism. But the fact is, the solution to the problem was a result of a black person and a white person working together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the solution to the problem. The black community is not going to solve the problem of racism. The white community isn't going to solve the problem of racism. It's the communities working together that's going to solve the problem of racism. Cassie, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I just want to say um, that was fantastic, um, Dr. Sauer. Uh, I agree 100%, and I think you put it uh, very clearly. I agree. Conversation has to happen. Um, it has to be honest conversation, lacking judgment, uh, willingness to understand, have compassion, learn, and make modifications. I agree 100% with you. Mm -hmm. So, Brian? Yes, um, this is on the white privilege, the, those two words, because I think as as well, that can be used in, a, in, an, in an incorrect way. And I really want the community, our entire community to recognize that it's not identifying a person as being that, it's really stating that, and I may not say this well, but I think it's important just for, for our audience to recognize that, that it's, it's not saying that putting you as uh, I think Dr. Sauer said, it doesn't mean that you you have to prove otherwise. 
It's just that it's an observation. It's a recognition. And I think that's important because otherwise we're going to have, we talked about the all lives matter versus black lives matter. I, I don't like the words white privilege because I think it creates a, a, met, a visual that someone walks around owning that when and that's not the case. It's really that there's a benefit of the doubt given by someone who looks at me differently than they look at you. And I think it's important for us to be really distinctful when we, when we do talk about that in our conversations. I welcome the conversation and I've had one with a friend who said, I don't look at myself as being white privileged. And he said he was actually angry that people, that he felt like people were saying he was until we had a dialogue on it. And the dialogue simply just said, if he and I both walked into a place together, there's a chance that someone would look at you or treat you differently than they would me just based off of what they see. So just wanted to offer that. Yeah, and I, and I think for, and again, I'm just speaking in general, just um, from my readings and my understanding, you know, for example, with Amy Cooper, you guys know that situation, right? Where she was in um, Central Park and the gentleman walked up and her, I guess her dog was loose and um, he asked her to please leash the dog. Um, this is what we offer it. And then she said, um, I'm going to call for help and I'm going to tell them that um, a, 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 a black man is threatening me. So um, I, I think what people would consider that as white privilege, meaning that she could at any moment use her, the way that she looks against somebody else, whereas um, a black person would not necessarily be able to do that. So not everyone, um, like you're saying, would even think to do something like that. But in that moment, she used her whiteness to basically say, I'm going to use this against you because you're doing something that um, I don't want you to do. So that would be one example of many of what people might consider as white privilege. And I think, Jordan, you're one of the only people who hasn't spoken to this issue. Would you like to say something on that? You're, you're muted, Jordan. You're muted, Jordan. My apologies. Uh, um, I think I think everyone uh, has kind of uh, said testaments to what I agree with. Um, to sum it up, really and truly, um, white privilege is really um, the existence of something that is there. It's not necessarily, and this is touching on what Brian said. It's not necessarily. Uh, people walking around saying you have white privilege, you have white privilege, da 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 da. Um, it exists, and the sooner we're able to openly have conversation and dialogue about uh, the benefits of white privilege and how that affects systemic racism across all, you know, institutions. And when I speak to institutions. I'm not referring to colleges and universities, I'm referring to the various in institutions that make up uh, the United States of America, um, the sooner we're able to further progress as it relates to race relations. Um, I, think, I think that would be an additional panel to this in exploring um, systemic racism, to be honest. Um, but, you know, there's always a start for something and I think um, this conversation on white privilege has been good thus far. So this leads to the next question for you. Lots of questions came up about training and, and learning opportunities, Jordan. And they basically said some comments mentioned the need for training and learning opportunities about race relations for faculty, students, and staff. There seems to be a desire for our academic communities to teach more in depth about our history of race relations, as well as have required training on diversity and inclusion, as well as on conscious and unconscious bias. What are your thoughts about this, Jordan? Great question. Um, so I'm all for this. I'm a proponent. Um, uh, I'm all for this. I'm a proponent um, and supporter of in-depth diversity, inclusion, equity, racial justice, uh, workshops, trainings, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, what I can say is I'm a member of a couple diversity committees at the institution, and this has been brought up um, specifically during this era, for lack of better words, or this time. Um, and we're currently in the middle of planning. So unfortunately, I'm unable to confirm anything at the moment, um, but I 100% received this message. The committees have received this message, and we do support it. 
Um, we're currently in a leadership transition at Sam Houston State University. As you know, uh, Dr. Hoyt um, is retiring. Um, she's been an avid supporter of diversity initiatives at the institution. And in my research, the incoming president, Dr. White, um, seems to be as well. Um, so I'm hopeful for more conversations and action on diversity trainings uh, and workshops of the sort. Excellent. All right, we're wrapping up. We have two more questions here. So our uh, second to last question, Amanda, do you think students are adequately informed about the history of race in America and how it impacts our current lives? Also, do you believe there is a generational difference in how people view race? If, if so, and you perceive a gap, do you think it can be remedied? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think there, um, maybe for me on a personal note, I don't think um, when I was learning about history, I took it as this really happened. This was something that as stated in history, this happened. Um, I figured, and I think ignorantly, that since that's not the color of my skin, I shouldn't have to worry about it. Like, okay, it's past, it, we're new now. Um, but I think that's in the ignorance of it. Um, I don't wanna say that not everyone has learned the history, um, just because maybe I wasn't paying attention in history class um, doesn't mean somebody else wasn't. Um, but I think for me, that wasn't as prevalent as um, maybe testing, um, making sure we're getting to these test things and, and moving on. It was just like, I've checked the box, I've taught them, but do they get this? Who knows? Um, but then again, that goes to your school system and everything else. But um, I do think that there is um, a generational difference. Um, I'm not gonna say that across the board that yes, this generation thinks this way and this generation does. I think it's yes and no. Um, I think, um, especially for me in a small town, um, there was that generation that was, I was learning things that were racist. They were, um, hard to admit, but it was, and it, it took me to get to college and being on my own and, and seeing those around me that it, um, that it was racist. Um, but I think that there is, um, kind of beauty in knowing, um, that there's honesty and openness to this, that, um, it's really, I, I don't want to say it's cool because this it should have been happening a long time ago, but it's cool to see that people want to learn and that this is a time for change. Um, the conversations aren't easy. Um, I have thought about having conversations with um, people that um, it's just hard, but is this conversation as hard as what the black community is going through? Probably not. Is setting your pride aside and your approval of others as hard as what they're going through? Probably not. Um, I think if um, just more people pour into those that they love, that they see, hey, maybe you should think this way, or or maybe there's um, there's a different side to this. And like, I know this is what you've been taught, but maybe think of it this way. Like everyone has been saying, you can unlearn things. Um, I've unlearned a lot of things um, about what I thought um, about white privilege and about positions I've been leading in and, and how I can be more effective in those. Um, so for sure, I think um, having those conversations is difficult, but not as difficult as what um, the black community is going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I often tell my students, that's a great point, Amanda. My dad was bus. My dad was bus to, um, uh, you know, to, to integrate at school. I mean, this is a part of my life. My grandmother lived to be 93 and she talked about how, you know, she couldn't go to certain types of towns or buy homes in certain places and her um, family talking about what happened in the Greenwood district with Tulsa and Black Wall Street. So, um, yeah, you're right. Um, all of us can can learn more and, and realize that for many of us, this is recent. I mean, this is how we live every day. And I'm just thankful that we're able to have these 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 conversations. I, I really am. Does anybody else want to add to what Amanda said? I think I want to recognize the subtlety of, of how tough it can be. And because you mentioned that, Amanda, and I think that that uh, if anyone sees your, when they see you, I, I mean, and hear your resume already, that you've been in tough situations before. You're, you're representing a student body on a, on a awesome university, you know, campus in the state of Texas. That's pretty difficult. I think we really need to help each other 
and recognize that it is difficult and recognize it so that we don't expect the conversation, the first conversation to be the winning conversation, but just the opening of the door. And so I'm committing because of what I've heard from you is that I need to act, I need to understand and appreciate how tough it is to approach me and say, hey, tell me about what you think or because, yeah, and I think it's important for anyone that's listening to think about, are you opening that door wide enough to just allow someone to just step in and look for a minute before they come in? Or are you only offering an aggressive problem solving conversation that most of us shy away from <laughs> in the during the day you know so thank you for bringing that up and i think that's an important uh, nuance to for all of us to remember as we think about how we're going to act going forward yeah i just want to add to that really quick um i think when i like a personal thing for me is when i open up about my ignorance to someone who's really close to me she's my vp on my eboard and she's black and i'm like hey I have no idea. I'm so sorry. And I want to learn. Um, yes, that was scary, but that was a person that I knew was going to love me back. And, um, mm -hmm. it was cool to see even the way she responded to that. Um, she said, thank you. We're going to learn. Like I, she's committing to help me learn through these things. Um, but then having those conversations with someone who, who may not be on the same page or who is coming from that point of view is that, we as an ally, as, as anyone should come at a place of love and not a place of anger. I found myself just getting so angry. Like, how can someone be ignorant? I was ignorant. That was me. Um, and somebody mm. didn't come at me with anger. They came at me with love and mm. grace and that mm. they wanted to actually teach me and not proving a point um, to me. So for sure. thanks for that. I appreciate it. Yay. Yay. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. I just think these conversations are great. I really do. And this is just, you know, one step in many. Um, Vic, did you want to say anything? Because I know you talked about being a problem solver. You and I talked about that before. And, and Brian mentioned <laughs> the problem solving element. And some people just think, I want to be help solve the problem because that's what we're trained to do. But then yeah. I understand what Brian is saying, that sometimes we're just taking that baby step and moving forward in a positive way. So Vic? No, I, I couldn't agree more. When, when Brian was saying that, I said, you know, I have much to learn here uh, because in my consulting and my teaching and the work that I did in industry and the work I did at the university, when I saw a problem, I said, it's, we don't need to discuss it. Let's just solve it. Mm -hmm. You know, the time you spend in a meeting is time spent not out on the, <laughs> the floor actually solving the problem. Yeah. And so I have that predisposition that I have to overcome that this is a problem that can't be solved by going out on the floor and taking some immediate action. And all of a sudden the control charts back in control or, you know, the yields are back up or the profits are back where they want to be. This is a problem that, that is so sociologically involved and convoluted and, and ingrained mm -hmm. that it's just going to take a tremendous amount of effort and conversation is the way to begin that. But it's not the end of that. We, as a result of the conversations, we need to go out and we need to start doing things. There are problems out there that need to be solved. And they're not simple problems, but we need to take action as well as to have these discussions. But then on, on another vein, I'll have to say, I feel older now when I heard Dr. Simmons talking about her parents and grandparents living through the same era that I lived through. <laughs> So, and then Kat, uh, Amanda talking about the generation gap, you know, she and I represent the extremes of the distribution here uh, uh, among the panel. And uh, I appreciated hearing and learn from what uh, Amanda had to say. And I appreciated hearing and learn from what Brian had to say. Thank you for that. Awesome. And our last question goes to Cassie, who is also Yay. a wife and a mother of two beautiful teenagers. Our last question is, obviously discrimination against African-Americans is an important issue, but many also mentioned the discrimination against other groups. These are the survey questions. What do you think the benefit is of going through the anguish of having these uncomfortable conversations about race? Um, thank you. Yeah, um, you know, I would say discrimination against other groups is equally important. Um, my hope and my thought is that having uncomfortable conversations about race 
um, will eventually make them or get to a point where they're not uncomfortable. Uh, the benefit would be that we don't have to have these. I mean, this is very hopeful, very optimistic thinking, but you know, you have to have uncomfortable conversations to learn, to change. It's kind of like, you know, if you're working on a sport or anything you're trying to get better at, there has to be some struggle, some uncomfortableness. Um, hopefully the level of uncomfortableness is reasonable. Um, you know, as we were just talking about, it's the conversation's hard. It can become, it's a, it's a conversation that can cause people to be very triggered, very defensive. Um, and, and I would say that that's pro probably natural and expected. And I think that, um, you know, that's something that we have to consider work on. And, and I also was thinking as y'all were speaking earlier that, you know, maybe it would be helpful if we had more training how to deal with, how to have a proper conversation, how not to fix the problem. I mean, that was an excellent point. And so, um, you know, just to get back to the point, we have to have the uncomfortable conversations that are needed. Um, my thought is that if you don't have them, how will you ever know that actions, statements, thoughts that you're having are unfair, demeaning, offensive, if we don't talk about them, if we don't bring them to light? Um, I think that we all need to recognize the part we play in perpetuating racism, whether it be intentional or unintentional. And that can only come from an honest, open dialogue where you're willing to listen, learn, and then change. Absolutely. So I want to thank everyone for being here for this um, initial conversation in COBA. I mean, I know we're all having them interpersonally, but in this format. So thank you to everyone. Uh, we want you to know that this is not the first conversation being held about the recent tragic events. These types of conversations have been happening across the SHSU campus. For example, earlier this month, the Center for Diversity and Intercultural Affairs fostered similar discussions that included separate panels to tackle different issues. We appreciate each of you who have been brave enough to join the discussion in such a public fashion. We sincerely hope that this conversation has been both helpful and productive. Please note that our Counseling Center is available if you would like to have more in-depth personal conversation. They may be reached at 936-294-1720. In addition, we received the following statement in advance of this program. The Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion is committed to promoting and welcoming an inclusive environment where students, faculty, staff, and visitors are aware of and demonstrate respect for cultural and individual differences. Training offered by the office includes, number one, evolution of diversity and inclusion, number two, inclusive hiring and recruitment practices, number three, respect and tolerance, number four, unconscious and everyday bias, Faculty, staff, or students can attend scheduled in-person or virtual events or can request customized programming for their group. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us as we seek to find positive solutions to address these challenging times. Eat them up, cats. You know what, cats. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I hope that this program has been informative and provided you with an opportunity to contribute, listen, and learn. Thank you for your participation.